It's like Lay's potato chips. You just can't be satisfied with one. You're gonna have two. Well, good morning. Good to see everybody this morning. Um, today's message has a conclusion, but it's all setting, setting up next week's message. So if it's like, well, what about it? We'll get to it. <laughs> Just a fair warning. <laughs> uh, we've been kind of using Acts chapter 1 as a foundation for where we've been working here recently. Acts chapter 1, verse 1. The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day in which he was taken up, after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen. I want to point out that Luke makes a connection and keeps it there between Jesus and the presence of the indwelling Spirit. We have talked many times that Jesus does everything in alignment with the Father. He speaks, he moves, he acts. Everything is in accordance to what God wants. And the reason Jesus is able to do that is because the Holy Spirit is speaking God's will to him as to what he wants accomplished. Jesus doesn't make an educated guess. He doesn't run around with a bracelet. What would Jesus do? <laughs> I'm not knocking it. I'm just making a point here. That he doesn't try to guess what he's doing. He knows exactly what the Father's will is. Because the Spirit within him is directing him. Here's what the Father wants done. So God speaks through the indwelling Spirit. And in this case, that individual is Jesus. Jesus receives that word as truth and authority. And then he obeys it. We've talked about this many times. The definition of what faith is. Someone speaking, in this case God, what we do with that word, whether we receive it as truth and authoritative and in our obedience to it, and the combination of those is what really faith is. I want to point out something that's important for us as we unfold this. Paul, um, writing to the church at Corinth, 1 Corinthians 15, beginning at verse 25, says this, talking about Jesus. For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. For he has put all things under his feet. In other words, God has put everything under Jesus' feet. But when he says all things are put under him, it is evident that he who put all things under him is accepted. In other words, God the Father has given all things to the authority of the Son except himself. In other words, God the Father always remains as an authority figure over Jesus. So everything is put under Jesus except the Father. Now when all things are made subject to him, then the Son will also be subject to him who put all things under him, that God may be all in all. I want to just camp out here on this for a moment because it's important for us. Jesus was fully obedient to the Father, suffering of the cross, death, all of that stuff. And the Father sat him at the right hand. Putting him in a great place of authority and ruling. But he is still subject to his Father. Revelation talks to us in Revelation chapter 5 that God's sitting on his throne as a scroll sealed with seven seals. Now we know from studying the book of Revelation that the scroll that's written on both sides and the seals have to do with end time events. And the opening of each one of those seals triggers a new series of events in the earth. So the opening of the seals is timing so when you open the first seal, it triggers something. When you open up the second seal, it triggers something. And John is looking and God is holding the scroll and the sound and the voice goes out and says, who is worthy to open the scroll? 
And John says, I haven't seen anybody who's worthy. So John begins to weep. And he begins to weep because unless somebody is worthy to open up the scroll, all the end time stuff doesn't come to pass. We don't spend eternity in heaven with the Father because all those things can't unfold. So John begins to weep. And one in heaven speaks to John and says, oh, no, no, don't weep. There is one who's worthy. And John looks and he says, I see one like the lamb that had been slain. And he's worthy. And he comes and he takes the scroll out of God's hand. Now, again, let's keep all the pieces together, though. When Jesus was asked, is your kingdom now coming? He said, it's not for any of us to know the timing. Only my father knows the timing. So even though Jesus is worthy to take the scroll. Now, why is he worthy? Revelation says because he prevailed. What did he prevail over? Jesus prevailed over every temptation to disobey his father. He prevailed over every temptation to simply act on his own. That's why he's worthy, because Jesus won't touch a seal until the Father says now. So with all that Jesus accomplished and given the seat at the right hand of the Father, Jesus the Son is still subject to his father. It is important because it's telling us, it's teaching us about us. We don't ever get to tell God what to do. Now, we can tell God how we feel, we can give God suggestions. We can pour out our heart. We can pour out our frustration. We can pour out our anger because our God is a big God. He is a father who can handle all of that. And he doesn't get offended. As a matter of fact, because he's our father, he wants us to pour our hearts out before him. In the notes, page 2, Hebrews 4. Seeing then that we have a great high priest. Again, what's the importance of the high priest? He's the one who you said, here's what I want you to tell God when you're in there. Here's what I want you to ask God. Here's, the, here's what I want you to pour out on my behalf before him. He says, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Therefore, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Hebrews 10, verse 19, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Our perspective before the Father must always be Father, show me what I'm supposed to do. Give me the words to speak in this moment or just tell me to be silent. Show me where it is that you need me to go on your behalf. Give me the activity that you want to accomplish in that moment. We are always subject to the Father. Just as Jesus remains subject to his father. Now I know in our day, many are repulsed 
by the idea of having God tell them what to do. The world doesn't want to be told what God has to say on any matter. But the reason that is is because they have believed a lie. The truth is, there are two kingdoms. There is God's kingdom, and there's the kingdom of darkness. And both of those kingdoms have a king. And the truth is, we are born subjects of that kingdom. The world doesn't want to acknowledge this. The enemy convinces us that we are independent from everything and that we can simply do whatever it is we want to do, which is a lie. Because we're all getting direction from somewhere. We're all being commanded to do things. You say, well, I don't hear it as a command. I hear it as something I want to do. It's still a command. We just have manipulated the words. The enemy manipulates us all the time. We are born under this kingdom, the kingdom of darkness, and that kingdom wants to keep us away from God, and it leads us in sin and unrighteousness. There is no other place. We're either under the kingdom of darkness or we're under God's kingdom of light. Those are the only two options. Again, the world's going to argue about this, but the truth is there's only two. We are either subjects of the kingdom of darkness or we're subjects of God's kingdom of light. So the world gets repulsed when we run around saying, hey, we should be doing what God says. And they're like, are you crazy? I don't want anybody to tell me what to do. When in fact, they're already being dictated to. They're already being controlled. There's already an authority that's speaking into their lives that they're obeying. I don't know how we help the world understand that other than communicating the truth and letting the Spirit do His work. But that's the truth. The other truth is this. We were created by God to experience the greatness of who we are under His kingdom. We will never, ever be satisfied. We'll never, ever be the experience of what people t call life or living under the kingdom of darkness. It won't happen. We might amass great riches. We might ascend to some great power of position or some place where the world respects us for who we are, but you will never find the fullness of life. Even if you are a giver under this kingdom, you'll never find it because we weren't created to live under that kingdom. We were created to walk with God. Now let's get back to Acts chapter 1 here for a second. Page, bottom of page 2 of the notes, headed to page 3. Acts 1 verse 3. To whom he also printed, presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them 40 days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So we've been talking about the kingdom of God in different pieces, and we're going to talk about it a little bit more today, some more next week. In these instructions about the kingdom, God gave them a direction. He gave them a mission. We know it as the Great Commission, where Jesus says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, teaching them to obey the things I've commanded you. Now, I know I keep pointing this out, but I just see it over and over and over in the church. We're used to the word commandments from the Old Testament. And when we see the word, we think law. But that's not what's going on here. Law is, again, just to highlight it, law is trying to be righteous without God. Law, law is living under the kingdom of darkness, trying to be an individual of the kingdom of light. It can't happen. Because as much as we want to do what God says, we're taking our orders from over here. 
So you can't be a vessel of the kingdom of light when you're under the kingdom of darkness. So when Jesus says, go and teach them all the things I commanded you, understand he's not talking law. He's not saying, by the way, guys, I gave you a list of things to do and a list of things not to do. That's not what he's saying. The reason for the first part of the message is Jesus took his orders from God by the Spirit. And he has given us the Spirit that we might receive our direction in the same manner. So it's God, now it's God, Jesus, Spirit, us. So it's not about a list. It's about what's the Spirit saying to me, the Spirit saying to you in your circumstance. That's what he's talking here. And again, we're often repulsed by the word command because we think, well, somebody's dictating over my life. Well, the, again, the truth is somebody is. We're, we're just not making our own decisions. Something has influenced us and has given us information that we're accepting as truth and authoritative, and we're obeying it. Well, yeah, those are commands. <laughs> so we need to get past the idea of, I don't want someone commanding over my life. It's just a word. It's an important word, but it's just a word. Go and make disciples, teaching them to observe all the things that I commanded you. So what was it exactly that Jesus had done for the apostles. First of all, he taught them truth. He said, here's what the kingdom of heaven is like. And they keep saying, yeah, but over here, this is, this is what we think we should do. And he said, no, you're wrong. And because you're over here, you've also misinterpreted the scriptures. So let me tell you what the truth is. So over and over and over, he taught them truth. He showed them reality of what the scriptures were meant to say. I just said that very poorly, but you'll give me grace. He explained the scriptures in light of being children of God. So he kept taking everything and bringing it back over and saying, here's what God means by this. He lived a life putting on display how a son walks with his father. And he trained them how to live like he lived. Remember, they said, Jesus, teach us how to pray. Okay. I'll teach you how to pray. And he taught them how to interact with God. Seeking from God his direction day by day. Let your will in heaven be done on the earth. Give me this day daily bread. Show me what it is that you want from me. Now, again, what's our connection to last week? Moses said, God, show me your way. That I might walk in it and be in your favor. Find grace in your sight. I'm getting ahead of myself. No, I'm not. Right there we are. Oh, look at that. Middle of page three. Moses says, show me now your way that I may know you and that I may find grace in your sight. And the Lord said, okay, I'll do that. Moses, I will show you so that you can follow me and do the things that I want you to do. I'll be right with you. And you can know me. It starts with the desire to walk with God and to please him. Not trying to prove myself. But walking with him because I love him. Again, there's a fine line often in our lives between law and walking with the Father in love. And sometimes we tend to flip back and forth and not realize that we're actually doing it. 
Moses isn't asking God to show him his ways. That somehow he can earn God's favor. What he says is, show me your ways that I can walk in your footsteps and be pleasing in your sight because I'm doing what it is you want me to do. Understand when Moses asked that request, he doesn't know where God's headed. He knows they're headed to the promised land at some point. But the promised land, as small as it is, is to an individual is actually still pretty big. So he's got to know, where are we going exactly? Which again, when we get to Joshua's day, and they're about to cross the Jordan River, I've always loved these words. God says to Joshua, have the four priests pick up the Ark of the Covenant and send them out first. And everybody else will follow them, and God says, because you have never been this way before. In spiritual terms, if this is what I know, then when it comes to walking with God, I've never been that way before. So God's way involves holiness and righteousness has major elements, but there's another major key, and that is God is love. 1 John 4, 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to also ought to love one another. 1 John 2, now by this we know that we know him. Again, let's keep the connection. Moses says to God, I want to know you, and I want to know your way. So John, when he's writing, says, and this is how we know that we know him, if we obey his commands. Not law. <laughs> if we follow in his footsteps. If we follow the leading of the Holy Spirit who's speaking to us. So if I'm following the Spirit speaking, then I know I'm connected to Him. First John uh, 2 4. He who says, I know Him and does not keep His commandments is a liar and the truth is not in Him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. So here we have one part of our lives. How do I prove? <laughs> Sorry, probably a bad word, but a bad way of saying this, not a bad word. If I say I love God, my life proves that by doing what he's telling me to do. I mean, it's, we can understand it as a position of children. We can understand it as a position of parents. How do we feel if our children refuse to do what we're asking them to do? Well, they don't respect me. There, there's an issue between them and me. Well, how do I know that they're loving me when they do what I have asked them to do? So one of the ways that we validate our love for God is simply by doing what it is he wants us to do, walking with him. By this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. Verse 9, he who says he is in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. He who loves his brother abides in the light and there's no cause for stumbling in him. But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. So John is making a connection. He's highlighting the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness. And he's also giving us some evidence. He says, if you love your brother, you're abiding in the kingdom of light. But if you hate your brother, you're abiding in the kingdom of darkness. 
There's ways in which we can gauge where I am in my relationship with God. First John chapter 1. This is the message which we heard from him and declare to you that God is light <clears throat> and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ his son cleanses us from all sin. Galatians 5.14 For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So in John's gospel, or in John's letters, we find the kingdom of God equals the kingdom of light equals the kingdom of love. Those three things are all connected. Discipleship begins with teaching people how to love. We teach them the word so that they understand who God is. But we teach them how to love. Because love is a key of the kingdom of God. How many times do we find in the scriptures Jesus had compassion on them? <clears throat> the Sermon on the Mount tells us things that are hard to hear. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. So many people will look at it and say, I just can't forgive that person. Or I just can't love them. Which is a valid statement from someone over here. And even from people here. Because it's a testimony that I need help. I can't do it on my own. I can't do it without God. So Luke 24 says this. Verse 44. Then he said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you <clears throat> while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. Then he said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And your witnesses of these things. But I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you're endued with power from on high. He reiterates that in Acts chapter 1. Sadly, a lot of people look at the word power. In the Greek, it's dunamis, yes, from which we get dynamite. That's normally where we go. And everybody says, oh, good, we get the power to perform miracles. Well, there is truth in that. But understand, there's a lot of things that come before that. And one of the greatest endowments of power we need is the ability to love. Because it's not found in the kingdom of darkness. Which means there has to be a transformation in my life. I have to get out what the kingdom of darkness has taught me. And I need it replaced with the truth of the kingdom of God. But not just the truth. I need the power of God in my life. And God is giving us the power to do those very things. Notice the fruit of the Spirit is not to go out and perform miracles. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, kindness, gentleness, long-suffering. Those are the attributes of the Spirit. Now, may miracles happen? Sure. Not because I did them, but simply because I was obedient to what God said. But I guarantee you those miracles are directly connected to love. So if I'm, will, if I'm unwilling to love somebody, forget the miracle happening. Verse 
Paul writing to the church at Corinth trying to fix their perspective. Because again, there's things from the kingdom of darkness that we've drug into the church. And I've used this illustration many times. One of the things the kingdom of darkness does is it loves the pyramid system. And says only somebody, only one or two people can be at the top. And then you just spread them all out down below. And we have drugged that into the church. The Corinthians were struggling with that concept in their church. They were arguing about which gift was the greater gift. Who was better? Apostles, prophets, teachers, the gift of miracles. I mean, gee whiz, how do you trump that one? Well, watch this. Oof. You know, so they were fighting over which was the greatest, which again, boy, I've heard that conversation before. Yeah, the 12 often had that discussion with Jesus in their presence. And what did Jesus say? The greatest in the kingdom of heaven will be the servant of all. So Paul, in dealing with this issue at Corinth, says, look, guys, there's all kinds of gifting. 1 Corinthians 12, page 4 of the notes. First, there's all kinds of giftings. And not everybody's an apostle. And not everybody's a prophet. And not everybody's a teacher. And not everybody has the gift of miracles. Not everybody has the gift of helps, administrations, or tongues. Not everybody has all of those gifts. He says they're all important, but desire the greater gifts. Well, wait a minute. If there's not a higher one, then how come he said desire the greater? Well, again, folks, when they created the Bible, they put a break there and they went to chapter 13. Chapter 13 is still the conversation going on. Paul didn't stop and say desire the greater gift and then say, eh, someday we'll get around to that. No, his conversation went on in his letter. This is a letter to people. And he says, desire the greater gift, and immediately says, though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but have not love. Again, we love to talk about chapter 12. We love to talk about chapter 13. We rarely put them together. Paul says you can have the most powerful gift that your mind imagines in the kingdom of God, but if you have not love, it's useless. Because if you're over here fighting for this top spot and you're not using your gift to serve other people, you're not here. You're playing around in the kingdom of darkness. If I have, become, I have become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal, and though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. I am useless in the kingdom of God if I'm not applying the gift God has given me in service of people. Because it's the only reason the gifts are given. We read out of Romans the other week. Ministering to other people. That's the point. It's not about which gifting it is. It's using that gifting and ministering to other people. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned but have not love, it profits me nothing. Now, we all know what's coming, and we read it almost every wedding. But listen to these attributes. Love suffers long and is kind. I heard those words somewhere else before. Oh, Galatians chapter 5, the fruit of the Spirit. Hmm, love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, 
endures all things. Again, take that list and land up against Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit. He's saying the same thing. Love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. Verse 13, and now abide faith, hope, love, but these three, but the greatest of these is love. When it comes to making disciples, we must teach people how to love. Because that's not what they learned in the kingdom of darkness. Hatred, envy, jealousy. Again, just read the verses right before the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5. Oh yeah, probably next week. <laughs> but the truth is, we need the power of God to love. We need the presence of the Spirit in our lives to direct us to love people as God loves them. We won't do it on our own. We will find a reason not to. So we must look to God and we must yield to Him and embrace the presence of the Spirit to teach me how to love. not just teaching people to say the right things to answers answers to questions we must teach them how to love which means then first and foremost we need to know how to love so we have to learn to seek the movement of the spirit and where we think we can't say God I know that you have the power to give me that I can't so unleash your presence in my life that I can love where I don't feel like loving. Amen? You stand with me this morning. Heavenly Father, uh, I'm known for taking my time. And that's okay for me. We're going to analyze and look at things to learn that we might grow and develop and mature in you. So Lord, help us to embrace the bits and pieces and to dwell on them, Lord God, and to meditate upon them and begin to press in, Lord God, to our relationship with you to do the very thing that you want us to do, to communicate with you to lean upon you, to draw from you what we need to be the children of your kingdom in this earth. Lord, our day desperately needs people of the kingdom. So Lord, help us, I pray, to prevail as Jesus did over temptations by finding our strength in you. In your name we pray, amen.